Tom here from Learn Systems, and we're here to talk about the iX System TrueNAS M50 that's here in front of us. If you want to learn more about me or my company, head over to LearnSystems.com. If you'd like to hire us for a project, click the Hire Us button at the top. If you'd like to support the channel other ways, there's some affiliate links down below, and hey, clicks on those are always appreciated. So, we have here a TrueNAS M50, and I've actually pulled one of, the, one of the motherboards out. And I said one because yes, this has dual redundant motherboards. And that is pretty cool. And before we jump into that, we'll talk at least step back a little and say, what's free NAS versus true NAS? I know this is the first question a lot of people have. So free NAS, completely open source operating system. I've done plenty of videos on my channel. You're very familiar with it, uh, maybe. And it is a excellent, open source software defined storage solution that's running on ZFS. And the question and comment seems to come up a lot on those videos of, well, is it ready for prime time? Can it be used? Does it have commercial support, et cetera, et cetera? And the answer is yes and absolutely. Now we have actually seen large enterprises using free NAS, but those of them that would like to have paid support options and want those, you know, five nines of uptime and absolutely want a turnkey solution, hardware, software, with support, with agreements, with warranties on all of this, there's any problem. And then to go a step further, dual redundant failover motherboards, along with, you know, up to 10 petabytes of storage. And the currently what you see outfitted here has over 250 terabytes of storage. So we'll dive into that in a second here. But you were looking for that turnkey solution. TrueNAS is the commercially supported version of FreeNAS. The interface you're familiar with, it is the Absolutely, this is something interesting you can look up, the most tested NAS software out there. It has a very large user base and they're taking the free NAS code and rolling it into true NAS. Now, the difference really is in the support. It's all the same thing you're familiar with, but one of the things they do slightly different at true NAS is, true NAS is several months behind on free NAS. So they roll out a update in free NAS and a couple months later, in case there's any issues or any bugs, then they roll out the updates for true NAS. They're mostly the same. There's slight nuance differences. With TrueNAS, you have a few extra tabs in there for support. You also, when you buy a TrueNAS, you can purchase an entire support package at different levels of how quickly you'd like a ticket responded to, warranties on the drives, the hardware, the motherboards, and agreements to get these things back up and running for mission critical systems. So if you are a decision maker in that IT space and you're looking for a free NAS solution that you couldn't pitch to the C-suite because they go, that doesn't have support or agreements. This is that solution that you can pitch to them that's going to have absolute support agreements and guarantees and, you know, it works really well. So we've done both of these in the field. We've deployed true NAS solutions to clients. We have deployed free NAS solutions to clients. Like I said, really the main difference is that extra uptime and the hardware you get. Specking out a system can be very difficult. It's a wonderful hobby for if you're trying to build something, but you don't necessarily want to, you know, hack something together when you're doing it in a data center. That can be a little bit dicey. You end up being the sole person supported. Doesn't mean it can't be done. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but it's something to consider that you really have to put the time in and do it. And when it comes to the level of engineering that went into this, this is really impressive. So doing dual motherboards and an NAS server is no easy feat. What they have done here is a lot of engineering to take this motherboard and keep it in sync simultaneously with the other one connected to all the same SAS drives at the same time. That being said, this is how they're able to achieve a redundancy where if one board fails, the other one takes over. This actually allows you to go a step further. You can do updates during production. You can say which one of these motherboards is the master and which one is the backup. And at that point, you can load firmware updates. You can load the uh, updates on it. You can service the board. And if one of these boards goes bad or if a firmware update, software update fails, no problem. It's already running on the other one and they can be switched in real time like I said, in production. This means without having to wait till, you know, those inopportune times and spend your Christmas morning updating a server because the only time the company shuts down, you can go, cool, I can just do this in the, you know, three o'clock on Friday <laughs> and not worry about it. In any case, someone's going to say never update on a Friday, but you know, live dangerously. How big is it? We'll at least cover that. I have a tape measure here. Uh, this does have about a 30 inch depth. Um, I just want to because the camera might be obscuring it and it does weigh a lot. So this thing's heavy. I've been very careful not to move it much. Now let's zoom in a little bit here. Let me actually slide the box out of the way. Well, we'll show the drives real quick. If someone wants to see this, it's 
you know, nice. The drive slide in and out, nice, easy. It's well made. Everything's well, well fitted. Uh, matter of fact, <clears throat> one of the things they do is when they uh, package all the drives, they ship them all not in the box. Everything comes really well packaged in these styrofoam uh, holders. Everything's wrapped. It's it's really, really well done. Uh, no problems at all doing it. Everything's like well machined. This doesn't feel like, you know, cheap or chintzy. And I did not snap that in because I wasn't looking. Let me, there. Click. No effort putting it in. It doesn't. So build quality really well on this. Now, I will spin it around once so we can show how the dual motherboards look. It's, hey, 250 terabytes still weighs a lot because we, you know, got some in there. Um, and by the way, and we'll pop this out real quick because I thought this was kind of cool. This isn't just a little fan that popped out for convenience. We also have some more drives in here. And this spot has four SSDs in it so they can slide out right like this. So now, you know, four more spots to store some drives. Uh, we do have dual power supplies. Not that that's exciting. It's like any other uh, server system. The power supplies slide out. One power supply is for one board. One power supply is for the other board. It's pretty simple there. And then this is toolless. There's just a little screw. It slides down. And this was able to slide right out. And it's, you know, fairly substantial and heavy. All right, let's get this out of the way and take a closer look at this motherboard on here. So when we take a closer look at the connectors on the back, this is some of the, you know, magic, so to speak, the extra engineering that's really going in there, that TrueNAS was designed to work with this hardware to make the redundancy work. So it's not like just the tray slides out and it's just a motherboard tray for convenience of service. You're talking about a system that was integrated with the software to work. So if you wanted to load TrueNAS on your own hardware, there's not much point in it because your hardware wouldn't have this. This is, like I said, some specially designed hardware. Spin it around the other way makes a lot of noise. We have two 10 gig connectors over here. So the two 10 gig connectors, we have the 40 gig QSFP and the SAS expander over here. Uh, properly outfitted, this will support over 700 drives. So yeah, you can put 10, 10 petabytes right now based on current drive sizes uh, of storage together for this particular unit. Now let's take a look at the overhead and a little bit closer look at the motherboard. So you see we have these dual Xeons right here. We have all the fans, which the fans are removable. Um, and on these nice little rubber dampers, they just slide up carefully. No, I'm not gonna pull it out all the way. Uh, but yeah, completely not too hard to remove. They're not socketed like drop-in ones, but you know, you're not replacing them. Ideally, you're not replacing them that often. That being said, that's what provides the cooling for this first processor. Then the second processor further back has its own dedicated fan. And you can see all the drive connectors and the controller cards, how they connect right here, and the extra expanders that are in there, and how they route back up to those edge connectors that we talked about right in the front. With the QSFP card, we do have 40 gigs of connectivity in this, but obviously this is a standard board and you can put different cards depending on the needs and how you wanna connect it up. I do like in the back here having those two 10 gigs uh, built right in. Now, what we're gonna be doing here for my tests and my demos is gonna be doing this with the 10 gigs. Uh, that's just what we happen to have here at the office. So we won't be able to get the full speed that this can actually do, but it has been certified with Veeam, Citrix, and VMware, and there's plenty of independent tests that have pushed it to its limits to prove it can do an incredible amount of IOPS and absolutely high performance in the storage. So how does this motherboard go in? Well, let's get that plugged in real quick. So the motherboard slides in like this. Very carefully while some free NAS engineer nervously watches me slide it and go, don't shove it too hard. I can picture someone saying that. And I have been very careful. That's why I had this out. I, want, I didn't want to slide it in and out multiple times. I wanted it to go in very carefully and uh, slide it in and away we go. It's, they're durable, but you don't want to abuse any of this stuff. This is very expensive, uh, very high end. And this demo unit is, you know, here for us to do some demos and do some software on uh, provided by them as a demo unit. So unfortunately I got to return it, <laughs> but uh, while it's here, we are going to do some videos with it, but I got to make sure it all stays in nice working order uh, so we can do some of our failover tests. Now, I'm not going to do it. Like I said, in this video, there's going to be some future videos where I dive deeper into it, but we'll fire it up and at least talk about the software and let's hear what it sounds like fired up. So I move the system over to the rack. It's installed, it's running, it's 
everything's good to go. But I also wanted to have it, I actually pulled the rack closer to me and the microphone's right there. So you can kind of get the idea of the noise. People always ask me, well, how loud is it? Um, I don't have a decibel meter, but it's kind of nice to say, well, can Tom continue doing his video and talking over it? And from this distance, it's not bad. I'm gonna push it back to push the noise a little bit further back and then we'll jump into the software. Now, one of the things I'll point out is on the ears on the front of this is each controller, not one power button for both controllers, but controller one and controller two controlled from each side of the ears. So now let's log in and take a look at the IPMI lights out management here. And this is nice. The first thing we're gonna do is we have a power down, power off reset. We're logged in, it's got the IP address at the top. We have the server health we can look at, sensor readings, and this is individual. There's one of these for each one of the motherboards. We're gonna log into one. Uh, you know, they're all pretty much the same. And if you did notice that there's some blinking lights in the front that has some issues, that's because we have not gone through this setup yet, which is why we're not going to dive into the, other than just doing an introduction to the true NAS software. There's going to be separate videos where we dive further into it um, once we have it all configured and I reach out to their team and set it up. They're waiting on me. We have the health event log, current power consumption on a per motherboard basis. Um, so a lot of nice features they have in here. Remote control, I like this a lot. HTML5. So here we go, we can launch and get there. Yeah, IO errors, those are the, it's not set up yet, that's why we have some IO errors. We haven't set up the HA or anything, it's waiting uh, to be done. But without any stupid consoles of Java or anything weird, right through the browser you can uh, access um, at the command prompt to be able to do things, record, macro, options, users, capture, or we have the power control there. So, and it does have the virtual media option, maintenance options for firmware, uh, factory default, etc. But let's get over here and look at the TrueNAS itself. So right here, pl uh, platform is TrueNAS M50HA. And we're gonna do our failover video separate, but you'll be able to initiate failover and switch between the controllers. Uh, it's gonna give me a warning right now that we can't do that because it's not configured. As you can see, the HA currently is disabled. Uh, but like I said, this looks a lot like the FreeNAS software. Matter of fact, it looks exactly like it. Please note though, jails are missing. Uh, they don't come with the hypervisor or the jails inside of here. These are dedicated to be storage servers. So those are omitted from there. And that's another difference between FreeNAS and TrueNAS is not having those as an option in there. Now, if you want to look real quick at like the processors in there, because I said I'd cover that, is an Intel Xeon Silver 4114 CPU at 2.2 uh, gigahertz. So we have uh, 40 threads in here. So that's, that's an impressive amount of power. So more than enough power to run quite a few um, virtual machines over iSCSI. It's not going to choke. It's going to be able to perform very, very well at very high speeds with a very demanding data sets on it. We'll take a look at the pool, how it's created right now. 124 terabytes available. And uh, let's view the disks inside of here. And we can see our boot pool, which was uh, provided by SATA DOMS. I didn't point them out, but they were in there for the hardware. Uh, then we have the all these wonderful drives, these uh, 10.9 terabyte available, but they're the 12 terabyte Western Digital Data Center drives that they shipped with. And these are those drives in the back. So I pointed out that there's a few drives that you can get to from the back. Uh, those are also attached to both back planes. So they're absolutely part of the um, system. These ones with the DA right here is uh, a few SSDs that are in there that we're gonna be configuring for some different options. We'll test some caching and uh, Z log, the zero intent log. By the way, these ones in the back are the NV connector. So uh, NVMe connectors on there. So a couple important notes about that. So this concludes part one of the video of getting started with it. What the hardware looks like, which a lot of people have been asking me about. I wanted to get this video out there. We'll do separate videos and I'll probably be doing it in my office because I don't, you know, I know people want to know how loud it is, but not everyone wants to listen to a software video with uh, that humming along in the background. I don't know if it's going to stay here in our studio or we're going to put it in our rack in the back when we do the testing, uh, but we're going to bring some other servers to it, do some connections, do some VM testing uh, and of course, the fun part, do some of that torture testing and show uh, just how that high availability works and talk about it and uh, break that down a little bit more detail because that's what's real important to people is when you want to put these in is, you know, not just how reliable is the hardware, but can the hardware 
survive a fault. How fault tolerant is it? And uh, that's where things get really impressive with it. And that's one of those key things is keeping that uptime in case you have a fault on one of these. Um, all right, and look for the part two coming up right after I reach out to them and get this configured and get all the HA set up and integrated into our network. Thanks. And thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from the channel, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon if you like YouTube to notify you when new videos come out. If you'd like to hire us, head over to lawrencesystems.com, fill out our contact page, and let us know what we can help you with and what projects you'd like us to work together on. If you want to carry on the discussion, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can carry on the discussion about this video, other videos, or other tech topics in general, even suggestions for new videos. They're accepted right there on our forums, which are free. Also, if you'd like to help the channel out in other ways, head over to our affiliate page. We have a lot of great tech offers for you. And once again, thanks for watching and see you next time.